So the choice of the word transmission for you uh, was definitely intended to be an automotive joke in addition <laughs> to a Dharma joke. Yeah. And I think that those two meanings are, are kind of inseparable for me in my mind when I think about the Dharma story that uh, of you of you since i have known you uh, mm. you're 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 like the longest distance pilgrim uh in <laughs> in the soto zen lineage that i know and uh. you you um make the most of the flavors of zen practice that involve uh being rootless and rooting it wherever you are and moving from place to place and having just completed a big move, uh, back to a place of very deep Zen roots for you. I yeah. want to know what moving around has to do with the practice for you. Yeah. We're back here in Oregon for the first time in four and a half years. And, um, yeah, the movement, Well, I get it honest from Dee in some aspects. She grew up moving around, and so that's a factor. But also just with all this work the last few years, you know, this this practice, formal practice, started for me because after we had moved up here the first time, and we had been here about a year and I was feeling very rootless and lost in a bad way, you know, mm -hmm. and and was basically, you know, calling it an existential crisis, you know. I mean, all my friends were gone. Everything I'd ever done, you know, consistently were gone. Um, we we're in this new place. It was so different from Louisiana. Mm. And... I got this clean bill of health at the doctor, mm -hmm. which... I wasn't expecting for whatever reason at the time. I was still holding on to some fear of dying young. And so when I got a, once I got a clean bill of health from the doctor, I was like, oh, well, then what am I going to do for these next, hopefully, 40 or 50 years? Mm -hmm. And how do I find a way to get rooted no matter where I am? Mm. And... I started, sort of started, you know, <laughs> and this is part of the transmission aspect too, I guess. You know, it started as an intellectual pursuit, as these things often do for Westerners. Mm -hmm. And then I finally read a book called Why Buddhism is True that gave me the, the scientific gateway that I needed at the time mm -hmm. to start meditating. And to to see, you know, like oh, well, these scientific studies say that that meditation is good for you. You know, monks have been doing it for thousands of years, but I need this mm -hmm. scientist, this American scientist, to tell me it's okay, or I did. You know, and so I very quickly I started meditating was not good at it, didn't know anything about it, was hurting myself a little bit physically, mm. and remembered that there was a little Buddhist temple uh, just a few minutes up the hill from us. So I asked them about meditation instruction, and they offered to, to let us come in and get some instruction and then maybe stay for a Sunday meditation and Dharma talk if we were interested, and, and that was it. Mm. And, you know, it was... It found me exactly where I needed it to find me. And and very quickly starting the formal practice in Soto Zen, there's that focus on cease from erudition. Mm -hmm. Stop letting this be just an intellectual practice, just something you're learning about, something that's interesting let go and drop down and see what these people are really saying to you and speaking to your heart. And finding Sangha really opened that up 
and and showed me how to see it in other people mm. or at least showed me the beginnings of how to recognize it and you know also the beginnings of how to see the things that I was still holding on to mm. that I needed to work on you know and and then uh, less than a year into being uh, doing this formal practice and being able to go to temple every Sunday, um, COVID happened, and the temple shut down in March. And then D was diagnosed with breast cancer in May. And at the time, it was a very scary situation, and it felt good to move back to Louisiana to be close to family in case the worst case happened, you know, we just, we were so scared. I mean, especially with COVID, like she wasn't going to have an immune system with chemo and everything, you know, it's just, we were terrified. And so we, we came back home, but you know, when we left and for a while after we were back in Louisiana, the monks here at the temple were recording daily or weekly Dharma talks and sending those out. And so there was still a way to be together a little bit with my sort of home sangha. Mm, another sense of transmission there. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. And and that that was really great, but when that stopped, mm. I was very alone in my practice, mm. you know. There were Soto Zen temples, I think, in New Orleans, but, you know, they weren't open for COVID and it seemed to be a a little different, you know, it was a different lineage and it just didn't quite speak to me in the same way. And there's very, something very special about the lineage that I happened to encounter and, and who I was when I encountered it. Um, and, and so I had to, knowing that I needed this practice and that this practice was going to help me get through and it was already helping me get through this incredibly difficult situation. I mean, my reaction when Dee got her diagnosis, neither of us could believe it. I was so prepared to meet that. Mm -hmm. I can't even really describe it now. I can't even really believe it now that we've been through it, but... Mm. At the moment of the diagnosis, you know, it's like a lot of things, I guess. You can either get caught up and, and fall into despair or you can accept that this is where we are now. And so what do we have to do? Mm. And what, what can we do to, keep, to stay rooted and to stay grounded and to be there for each other and for me to be there for Dee when... It was going to be very hard for her. Mm. And so around the time that those calls started, here's another transmission. <laughs> <laughs> I searched Soto Zen on Twitter or around the time those calls stopped, excuse me. I, mm -hmm. I searched Zen on Soto Zen on Twitter and you came up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you were about the only one who mentioned it outright. And other than a monk who I'd actually met up here from Vancouver. And so I started following you and started finding uh, an online sangha, you know. And this was peak spirituality Twitter and deep, deep COVID, um, you know. And all of that, and we so it was a little easier. Twitter, then that's what we were doing. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was really like a bunch of actual Buddhists at the time before all the other. It was. It, it really was people who were maybe being forced to really do the practice, yeah. you know, and and uh, and really have to go deeper because they were they were all dealing with their own big thing, you know, and in so many different ways. And so. I also started weekly calls with my good friend Erica from the temple here. We started by reading a chapter each week from the Jinkoroku. Uh -huh. I remember you sharing those. Uh, the recording of the transmission of light. And 
and that those two things finding a way that i could say stay somewhat steeped in the dharma throughout the day just by having people talking about it and and doing their practice publicly on twitter <laughs> and having this weekly connection to someone up here who had become such a, a fast friend and who we share so many so much karma and have a lot of <laughs> mm. the same koans that we are dealing with and it showed me that i could do this practice anywhere mm. that as hard as it was to to not be able to go to the temple we you know Sangha is still available, and fr the friends are still there, and the Dharma is still there, and uh, yeah, it just building up the practice and and letting it be what it needed to be, where I was, instead of holding on to an idea of what practice should be based on the r rules that I learned when I started it. You know, I'm not. You know, obviously, still to uphold the precepts and and I'm, I'm still doing my practice but or and if something needs to change because it's actually harmful but it's the quote right thing to do then just let it change and let it be where you are and find the heart of it again rather than the letter of the law you know or or whatever and Coming back to Louisiana in that way really let me connect, reconnect to Louisiana in a different way and see it in a different way. The actual land and culture. And that was a really beautiful thing. And really, you know, when we left, it was a feeling of we got to get out of there, mm -hmm. you know. And when we came back, it was like, oh, yeah, there are some good things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and now in 2024 and for a good bit of the last year or so, it became clear that it was time to move on again, you know, that for both of us, for where we needed to be, what we needed our practices to be, you know, Dee's practice has grown significantly after going through chemotherapy and everything else, you know, and, and feeling, you know, like having to accept that she might die, you know, it was, yeah, just really have to look that in the face. And, uh, and, and so that has opened up so many things for her to where she is actually very close to where I was seven years ago in terms of she's been able to let go of so much that now she's sort of needing some grounding again. And so being able to go back to the temple for the first time yesterday, she had only been once or twice before when we were here and it just, she wasn't ready, you know, and, and, and there wasn't nothing wrong with it. It just, it wasn't where she, she wasn't where she needed to be for that kind of practice. And, you know, she grew up the son of a, a pastor and, or the daughter of a pastor, <laughs> excuse me, and and had to, some religion stuff to work out, yeah. you know, especially coming from the South and America and everything else, you yeah, know, and so it happens. And yeah. I was, you know, relatively unburdened with that, mm -hmm. with my unique upbringing for the South, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. um, and so now being back and, and and traveling these last three falls and making this be our big trip this fall and potentially more. She was able to connect to the Dharma mm -hmm. <laughs> in a really beautiful way yesterday. I mean, the Dharma talk was just laser guided right at both of us. I mean, literally the first thing that came up was about having to move when conditions are just not going to get better. Wow. Not you know, <laughs> and and about, you know, one of Reverend Master Jiu, the founder of this order, one of my favorite quotes of hers is, is, is 
being a Buddhist does not mean being a doormat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you do just have to, you know, it's not easy. And that's what the part of the talk was too, you know, it's not easy. It's really hard. I mean, what we just did was so hard. We're still recovering. I mean, it still hasn't sunk in in some ways because it was just such a whirlwind and the drive was insane. Yeah. <laughs> and we haven't really been able to get settled here yet. And, but even with all of that, like we both were able to get so centered yesterday and find so much joy and energy. And I mean, she and I literally had a talk this morning about keeping our feet on the ground mm. and you know, no matter where we are, you know, and cause it's so easy to get caught up when everything is so, all over the place. I mean, literally our stuff is in two different cities. The van is a, looks like a tornado hit it every time we wake up and, <laughs> you know, and, and we've had to move around from a few different places already, just trying to be here at the campground. And yeah, it's just a, it's all a reminder of like, how important the practice is, how much we can do for each other anywhere and, and a reminder to do it anywhere. You know, we did get caught up on the road. There were some really hard days and we got snippy with each other and, and you know, all those things when you're just, you know, you're busy all day and then you crash and fall asleep and then you got to wake up and get busy all over again, you know, and, and, and so, and, and living on the road the last three falls, at least like a month to almost two months, I think the first year, you know, that is an excellent way to, I guess, be in that mode of like, everything is changing all the time and there's still work to be done. And if you just focus on everything changing all the time and and that you want it to be easier or, or have less to do or, you know, you start holding on to, but I want it this way, that's when things start to get harder, you know, and, and reminding ourselves that we can come together and we can give each other a big hug and a few deep breaths and just be honest with each other. You know, a lot of times that was it too. Like it, it, some of us, one of us was feeling something that we felt like we couldn't say because we knew we were both so worked up. Is this going to make it worse? Am I going to say it in a shitty way and, and, you know, make it worse or whatever. And, and time and time again, and that's, that's a theme of our entire relationship as, as has been when we're feeling crazy, we need to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 first night that we told each other I love you which the anniversary is coming up of that it's a very special time of year for us um we she had come over to my house and we had a great time and she was going to leave and we both wanted to say it so bad and we were both so scared because of a million reasons, you know, just dating in your 30s and being single for so long and just a million reasons. We were old friends coming back together and we were having such a good time being friends. It was like, are we going to ruin this? You know, all those things. But then I, I just, and it's, you know, it, it sounds lame, I guess, in some degree, but I, I had to call her up and just say, look, I love you. <laughs> And I hated that it was on the phone, but I just couldn't hold it in anymore. And and that was when we realized, like, if, if we're holding that in, like, that's what's made us feel so bad all these other times. These other relationships and other things is when we're not being true to ourselves out of fear or preconditioning or karma. But we can trust each other. And we know there's such a connection 
and we know each other's heart so well that we can always come back and we can always find it again and be there with each other again and walk on, you know? Man, talk about a transmission. <laughs> <laughs>